Thank you, uh, moderator. I see you are insisting on very quick, quick, quick. <laughs> I will speak on Malawi. We are right now dealing with a protracted cholera epidemic. Next slide. Next slide, please. Which started in February of last year. But before I share with you what this looks like, let me share with you some antecedents that everyone must consider in appreciating that particular epidemic. The first one is that prior to this particular outbreak, the last reported cholera epidemic in Malawi was 2021 and 2022. Since that time, there has been none. Yes, of course, there may have been a few cases I know, for example, uh, uh, David is here. He talks about uh, Lake Chirwa in, in some part of Malawi, where we suspect that there are always some cases there. Um, but they have not come to the extent where they constituted an, out, an outbreak for the country at that point. The second item that people should know is that the majority of the Malawi population does not have access to safe water sources. Equally, they do not have access to adequate sanitation. We are talking of about 52% access to water. Ah, okay. Uh, access to water and 29% of the population uh, that's, that's a population that is actually not having access to safe water, 29.5%, and 52.1% do not have access to safe, uh, to adequate sanitation. Secondly, Malawi has also had their share of cyclones recently, in, last, in the past five years. The first one was Cyclone Idai, which was in 2019 and it did destroy infrastructure, water and sanitation infrastructure, particularly in re uh, districts of the Southern region of the country. It was followed not too long after that by Anna. Again, it targeted districts in the Southern region. The third one followed in the same year, and that was Gombe. Again, because of its proximity to the Indian Ocean and Mozambique, which usually gets a lot of these cyclones, districts in the southern region were affected. And lastly, but not least, this year, we had Cyclone Freddy. Again, affecting a lot districts of the southern region. So when I move to the next slide, therefore, to show you what the numbers are looking like for this epidemic, you should be able to reflect what those antecedents may have to do with the timing, but also the location, geographical and otherwise, of the epidemic. I was hoping that there would be a pointer here. There is, is that? No? I don't see it. This one. Oh, OK. So as I mentioned, we started in February of last year. And it went through stages. And certain interventions were introduced, or certain events did take place. And I would like you to appreciate that normally in Malawi, we see the epidemics in the rainy season. It's seasonal. This February, this August, sorry, is totally out of season for Malawi. The rains begin around October to around March. But this time, it happened around here, not too long after the first three cyclones. And the it scared the whole country, and the head of state declared 
a state of emergency when the numbers continued even before the peak of the rainy season. And he went further around this time to designate a presidential task force to which I belong. I'm a co-chairperson of that task force, but it was set up for COVID. But he decided that the same should be designated as a Corella task force. And immediately he did that, he also launched, from our institution obviously, we told him that we needed to have a campaign to intensify all the reactivities that needed to be implemented. And yes, thank God, yes, it had already started to come down a little at that time, but the elements of the campaign did help to bring the numbers down, and they have continued to go down. The good news is, even when Friday came, and a lot of populations were actually moved into IDPs, uh, internally displaced people's camps, the numbers have remained declining. To this day, the good news I can talk to you about now is we are probably already at the point where we can say we have won the battle. But I don't want to be that brave as yet. But definitely, we can see one particular feature of this outbreak. The southern region districts are the ones that are darker here. But also, there's a darker of districts along the lake shore. So it attacked mostly districts along the lake shore as well as districts in the southern region. The southern region is where all, mostly, all the cyclones that I talked about landed and destroyed. The case fatality has been one of the highest so far, cumulatively. But I will show you that progress has been made. It's an epidemic that has shown us that it has a demographic face to it, mostly men affected. But also the, those that are suffering are the young, economically productive population. Unfortunately, on the opposite, those that have died are mostly those that are older. This is another area for us that dis displays what the epidemic looked like. Very high mortality rate, and this is since the beginning in, in, in March of last year. And you can see how it was dancing all over the place. But thank God, today, I can tell you that as of the past one month, we are really able to talk about zeros nowadays. What happened then? What did we do? Governance issues, first and foremost. As I saw in the first, first slide, it was declared a public emergency by the highest authority in the land, number one. Number two, he appointed a task force in his office that had the ability to go to any ministry and hold them responsible. And that task force was also able to develop a national preparedness plan that was a blueprint for all other ministries and sectors to take guide from. Then, of course, there was the issue of mobilizing. When we talked about the uh, response and the, uh, the governance issue, for the first time in December, when he said the task force should take on cholera, he included the Ministry of Water and Sanitation as a member, the Minister of Water and Sanitation as a member of that task force for the first time. And that meant that whatever resources they had and projects they were implementing did benefit the responses that we are talking about. There was then the issue of case management, identification and treatment of cases. I must give credit to a lot of partners who actually partnered with government in terms of building the capacity for identification, for prevention, for diagnosis, for treatment, including building the infrastructure for caring for these cases, 
it also included the provision at different times of oral cholera vaccine. And I don't want to mention specific, uh, specific partners, but I am not able to forget that for 20 years I worked for WHO. And so I must recognize UNICEF, WHO, Red Cross, and other partners, bilateral and mitral donors, who were able to give us a surge, particularly in this area, of setting up the systems for management of these cases. Water and sanitation, because of the inclusion of the Minister of Health of, of Water and Sanitation, it included mostly drilling of boreholes, an amnesty for free water for peri-urban areas. It also included the reviving of dysfunctional boreholes and targeting of hotspots, including schools. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, we did not have a lot of cases in our schools, but we still had a lot of cases in peri-urban areas. But fortunately, there are in those peri-urban areas water boards, four of them, spread across the country, and they were able to give this amnesty that I talked about. They also included connecting of water to these disadvantaged populations. There was an issue about risk communication, very critical. And eventually, these were actually taken forth to the community and given as leadership platform for the, uh, for the leaders in there. And can I mention a few specific things that actually happened? There was a capacity building, particularly for the community areas. There was set up of mobile clinics. As I said, we had a cyclone Freddy, which meant that we had to move populations from their homes to IDPs. And there was need for set up of mobile clinics because most of their areas were impassable. One item that I think was new for us, but it has become a darling of a lot of us, is the community oral rehydration points. This was new. Before this, everybody that was suspected would be taken to the hospitals or to the treatment centers. But after some time, some bright ideas came up with the thought, why don't we start putting oral rehydration points in the communities where the people are before they even get to the treatment center? I can tell you that these helped a lot. Some are even now there now, even though there are no cases in those areas, because the chiefs and leaders have said, my people had died before. I want to keep this particular initiative so that if anybody shows up again, we will treat them here before they even get to the hospital. This is an area that I think was new for us. Then of course, we had to take care of continuation of essential health services in the country. So there was an assessment and initiatives introduced to deal with that. OCV was given three times. It was, each, at each time it was targeted to the hotspots districts. And it also depended on the availability of the dosages of the stocks that were in the country. This was all a one dose uh, uh, initiative. I wanted to show here that as a summary, across the occurrence of the epidemic, there were things happening. I'm believing that these slides are going to be shared, and I think people are going to be able to track what particular activities were actually implemented along the way as part of our uh, strategies. Key achievements, I think the main one I can say is one that uh, there, has, there was good much sector collaboration and coordination. As I talked about the task force, it was possible for the task force to walk anywhere and give guidance to all the sectors and all the ministries, including the ministers. That task force, by the way, includes eight government ministers, including Minister of Water, Minister of Finance, Minister of Public Information, Minister of Health, who happens to be my co-chair. We are the two of us together. We also have improved community awareness and participation. I did, I did indicate that. 
Then we have had treatment care and tr treatment improvement. You have seen how mortality actually went down because of community surge, treatment surge at facilities, but also declined incidence and case fatality. Despite the latest Friday, we were able to sustain the decline that had started. One item that I must say is that in the last week, to show you that maybe this is not just a bigger picture, in the last week, there were only 23 cases reported, which was 57.4% de decrease. There are zero deaths for the whole of June, in fact. Not a single case now. Two districts only are continuing to report cases. And I'll mention very soon uh, something about these two cases. And this is the whole thing of it. This is the trend of cases since the beginning of May. This number, 78, now we are at 23, as I showed you. Death, we, are, we started at two at the beginning of May. We are now at zero. Case fatality has been zero. And number of districts that continue to report are the two that I mentioned. But at the end, we have 28 districts in Malawi. Today, 21 of them have been, have been declared that they have not declared because we are a bit, we are a bit cautious to tell anybody that we have actually con con controlled cholera in those districts. So we are saying in our counting and accountability, we know that only seven have not yet gone 14 days without a case. We now have the two districts, as I mentioned. For the future and challenges, case management, obviously, we needed a lot of resources. WASH, the coverage has already been very poor. And it is still expensive. We still have to work very hard on that. Risk communication, we must continue to also work on that. Supplies and logistics was an issue. We're coming actually from the time of COVID. And this is going to continue to be taken care of as a need in case we have another, uh, another outbreak. Surveillance was an issue, including availability of capacity to do culture. Our diagnosis says culture positive is the case, first and foremost. After that, after the first case, yes, then you can use RDTs if they are aligned to that case, or you can use epidemiological link if they are aligned to that case. At the moment, that's what we are focusing on, especially. Almost even every RDT, we are saying, let us do culture. We don't have that capacity at the moment. Some of our district hospitals do not have the capacity to do that. Then we are facing the issue of environmental degradation. And that is going to continue to need to be addressed. Priority knobs, surely it's the health system issues, including uh, supplies including OCV, and I know everybody has been talking about it. We are no exception. We would like more OCV going forward. We would like to also make sure there's universal access to water and sanitation. We would like to have a multi sector national capacity. If this task force that we are talking about is put down, we must have a system that is remaining at the district level to continue to coordinate the work. And I've put in red cross-border initiatives. The reason is, and um, my brother from Mozambique is here, the last week there were uh, seven suspect, eight suspected cases. All of them, this is Malawi. This DACA is actually a community from the Mozambique side. So there is no doubt that this thing does not obey borders. So we must make sure that as we build our capacity, we must build the capacity for cross-border collaboration. I thank you. Thank you so much.